Hi everyone, this is me Omar talking to you today about the basal ganglia, which is very important uh, topic in neurology because it's also connected to the pathological, pathological change in the brain and as many of you they are familiar with Parkinson's disease and the other diseases that are related to uh, the basal ganglia which I will not talk about it today but I just will talk about the Parkinson disease but basically today I will be explaining the circuits and how it works and uh, when you understand the circuits and how it works that's very easy to understand the rest which is will become very 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 much easy so the basal ganglia, I start with the definition. The basal ganglia, they are uh, nuclei located in the brain, in the third, uh, near the third and the, the lateral ventricles of the brain, and near the thalamus. Uh, so, they are responsible of controlling of voluntary motor movement. By that, I mean they are uh, controlling the initiation of movement and controlling how the movement stops and coordinating of the muscle movement all the I mean the voluntary the voluntary motor movement controlling it and also related to the learning uh, abilities like when you learn how to practice on a piano it's also saved in the premotor and the uh, motor areas but also it, the program will be saved also in the basal ganglia because it's also uh, related to this uh, uh, kind of move to these kind of movements so you have to understand this very well and also some of uh, textbooks also put cognition and emotions into place but basically you have to understand they are controlling the mo the voluntary motor movement well let's say coordinating also well, basal ganglia we have five of them the stratum, which composed of caudate nuclei and potamine, the globus pallidus, internus and externus, the substantia nigra, which by far is the most important one because it's related to Parkinson's disease, the nuclei, nucleus accumbens, the subthalamic nuclei or subthalamic nucleus, which is also connected to Parkinson's disease in some extent. <coughs> This is the basal ganglia, where they are. Okay, this is the, the uh, lateral ventricle, and here is the thalamus nearby it. And I will show you better. This is the cross section of the brain. This is the cortex, and you see it's a, a gray. Uh, why it's a gray? Because the cell bodies, you know, the neuron, they are composed of cell bodies and axons. The axons, they are this white matter. This is the internal capsule, where the fibers goes through it. It's like a, it's like a runway or some point, uh, some road that the fibers go, the, the, the axons comes and goes through. So the cortex, it's gray because of the uh, nasal's bodies inside the uh, body of the neurons. While it, the axons, they lack that uh, nasal's bodies, so uh, for that they look white. This is the reason why. Uh, so you understand the bodies are here and the axons are here. So uh, when the, the fibers, the, the, the action potential will start in the bodies of the cell here in this area. So that this is here now, for example, the premotor area or the motor area. Call it what you ever. Now, for now. So uh, this fibers will, will, will take the information back through the body and also some information will come through the sensory fibers to the cortex and the, to the, let's say for the sensory cortex and so on and so far. This is a good image showing it <coughs> and uh, drawing uh, image. The caudate nuclei, this is the lateral ventricle, the third ventricle, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and you have, well, this is the thalamus, you see uh, this is the subthalamic nuclei which is a part of the uh, basal ganglia, the substantia nigra, the potamine, uh, I mean the potamine, the globus pallidus, and the caudate nuclei, as I said, and the most, by far the most important one is the substantia nigra and subthalamic nuclei. This is uh, MRI of the brain, showing the same uh, orientation. Uh, this is the thalamus, the, the, this is the basal ganglia, as how they oriented, and here 
I want to talk about something not related to our subject for, subject for today, but very, very related to uh, understanding the imaging of uh, the brain using MRI or CT scan. <coughs> when this is the, called the principle of uh, symm uh, symmetry. In the brain, everything should be similar to the other side. I mean, there's two hemispheres, the left and the right. The right should be exactly as the left, for a certain extent. So when there is a deformity, if you draw a midline here, a midline going through the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle, a midline, a midline comes like this, you separate it in two parts. When you look at it, if there is a kind of deformity here, like a crescent-shaped mass, maybe sub subdural hematoma, maybe you can see a tumor or something, or a shifting from the midline, that means herination, for example, maybe. That is due to a pathological change in the affected side. So when you see there is no symmetry between the both sides, you understand there is a kind of problem. Even if you didn't understand anything about uh, uh, emergency medicine or about neurology, you understand there is some kind of problem in the brain because it's not similar to the other side. I just wanted to throw this uh, like uh, bonus information if you want. Let me go to the other one. This is a 3D uh, model. And this is the same in the sagittal plan of the brain, the MRI. <coughs> this is actually the pathway. Uh, I know this is look complica looks complicated, but I will break it down and it will become so easy. And after, I think, I hope, after you're finishing this video, you will be uh, very glad you watched it and you get some information out of it. Uh huh. Let's go. Now, that's what I done. You have uh, to understand. The red arrow representing the excitation of the neuron, the stimulation of the neuron by glutaminergic, mean using glutamine as a neurotransmitter. This red arrow means excitation, stimulation. The blue one, inhibitory, means inhibition of the neuron using uh, gamma aminobutyric acid GABA which is a neurotransmitter that is inhibitory so now you understand it the red arrow excit uh, excitation the blue one inhibition so let me talk about the circuit here in this image you see that this the, here is the motor and the premotor cortex this is the cortex of the brain I should divided to two of them the motor and the pre premotor but the, for the sake of simplicity I just draw it in the same box or I just wrote it in the same box uh, so but keep it in your mind let's say like here is the premotor and here is the motor this is not a big deal when you want to initiate a movement the premotor area gives information red arrow uh, excitation, action potential, call it what you want to call it, to the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia will respond to the thalamus. And the thalamus will send information to the motor area, excitation to the motor area. And then the motor area will uh, give the information back to the muscles which are needed to perform the uh, movement through the pyramidal pathway, which is the corticospinal tract and the ribrospinal tract, through the pyramidal pathway, they, it will give information to the affected part. This is the simple way of saying all of this. But now let's talk about how the uh, uh, basal ganglia actually works. Now, you have to understand, this is the potamine. The potamine always inhibiting something. And we have direct and indirect pathway by which it acting. The function of basal ganglia it's uh, actually it's to balance the movement. When you want to initiate movement you should remove this inhibition from the thalamus so the movement will be performed. It's like when you are resting you don't want your hand to be jerking off you don't want your hand to be moving around without your uh, controlling it. You don't want an involuntary movement of your hand or involuntary movement of your mouth or 
nothing of this you want. So, what the basal ganglia does is to inhibit the thalamus through the globus pallidus internus to prevent him from giving signals to the motor area so no movement will be performed. So, in case of your resting, the globus pallidus internus, which is a part of the basal ganglia, always stimulate itself and gives inhibitory uh, information to the thalamus, keeping him from stimulating the motor area. But when you want to initiate movement, this globus pallidus internus should be inhibited. Why it should be inhibited? Because it's already inhibiting the thalamus. So when you, ha you have to put it in, this is in your mind. This is the, the, the complicated part of the whole thing. If you understand this, nothing will be complicated anymore. The glupus pallidus internus, when it's stimulated, when there is a stimulation to the uh, glupus pallidus internus, it works by inhibiting the thalamus. And when is, there is inhibition to the glupus pallidus internus, it works by uh, removing the inhibition from the thalamus because it's already inhibited, so it will not fire and then it, it will draw the inhibition from the thalamus so the thalamus can kick in and can give information to the motor area and then the motor will be performed. Enable, in, 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 well, in able to do this, the potamine, this part, should work. So the premotor cortex will give information to the potamine. And then we have two pathways, the direct pathway and the indirect pathway. Why it's called direct? Because it's directly affecting the globus pallidus internus. The whole idea is to affect the globus pallidus internus because this is the one which is uh, connected to the thalamus. So the whole idea through the direct pathway and the potamine here, uh, very important uh, information, the potamine always inhibits whether it's inhibiting the globus pallidus internus or whether through the indirect pathway inhibiting the globus pallidus externus. So it always inhibits something. This is a negative guy. This is the, the, the bad guy. Always when you stimulate him, it will start inhibiting other people. So it will always inhibiting the, the, the something. So through the direct pathway, it will inhibit the globus pallidus internus. And that will lead to the uh, inhibition of the globus pallidus internus, which was inhibiting the thalamus. Keep it in your mind. When this guy, the globus pallidus internus, fires, it sends inhibition signals to the thalamus. Not a stimulation one. Inhibition th signals uh, to the thalamus. So when it's already inhibited, this inhibition signals will be inhibited from the thalamus, and the thalamus will send information to the motor area, and then back to the uh, pyramidal pathway, and then to the muscles, and then the movement will happen. Now, but if only this pathway is present, there will be, there is no way to stop the movement anymore. So for that we have two pathways. The other pathway is the indirect pathway, which is called indirect because it doesn't directly affect the globus inter pallidus internus, but through the globus pallidus externus and subthalamic nuclei. Here the subthalamic nuclei, you have to understand, it works by, by, uh, by stimulating the uh, globus pallidus internus, giving the red arrow stimulating it so it will inhibit again the, th uh, the thalamus to uh, to stop the movement because if one pathway is there there will be no stoppage of the movement and the movement will go forever so we have to make some kind of balance because I, I, I told you the basal ganglia actually working as balance center for the movement or coordinating the movement balancing it initiate it and also stopping it so through the potamine will give inhibition, as I, al I told you, it always inhibits something. Give inhibition to the glupus pallidus in externus. And the glupus pallidus externus, in the normal way, when it was excited, uh, when there was excitation of the glupus pallidus internus, the glupus pallidus externus always inhibiting the subthalamic nuclei to prevent it from stimulating the glupus pallidus internus. But see when, what happens. When you inhibit the glupus pallidus externus, the normal inhibition will be removed and the subthalamic nuclei will stimulate the glupus pallidus internus, which will always inhibit the thalamus and then, 
and then the uh, the move the, the movement will be will be uh, distinguished or uh, that will be stopped okay let me just come back I think some kind of problem happened uh-huh okay so so I said the subthalamic nuclei will uh, will, will give uh, stimulation to the globus pallidus internus, and then will the movement will be stopped because the sub, uh, the globus pallidus uh, internus, as we know that when it is stimulated, it will give inhibition to the thalamus, and then to, uh, that will inhibit the uh, motor area, and then will uh, uh, will stop the movement from occurring. Now we are coming to the role of substantia nigra. Substantia nigra using dopamine. And as you know that what why it's called nigra because the, there is the this black color happens because of uh, uh, tyrosine which is and ferrin aniline also and tyrosine which was always uh, also used in making melanin so it gives this dark color for it. So for that they call it the substantia nigra but this is irrelevant to our topic. The dopamine which is produced by substantia nigra we have two dopaminergic receptors, dopamine 1 and dopamine 2. As you see from what I draw, the dopamine 1 is in this side and the dopamine 2 receptor is on that side. So substantia nigra, when it's producing dopamine, it will actually, the dop uh, it will actually uh, give dopamine to the do dopaminergic receptor 2, which will be Exact, uh, it will be stimulated because dopamine 2 it is stimulated by dopamine and dopamine 1 it's inhibited by dopamine. You have to understand this, this, uh, this uh, idea. Dopamine 2 is stimulated by dopamine and dopamine 1 is inhibited by dopamine. So now you understand how the substantia nigra works. By what? By giving inhibition to the uh, this to the indirect pathway that will lead the globus pallidus externus to be free from the inhibition from putamine and to give inhibition to the subthalamic nuclei to remove the excitation and through the dopamine, dopaminergic 2 receptors the dopamine will be uh, stimulating the dopaminergic 2 receptors giving stimulation to the globus uh, to, I mean giving inhibition to the globus pallidus internus and removing the inhibition from the uh, thalamus and then the movement will be kicks it will be done so now you understand how the movement happens through the uh, uh, th through the extension nigra it works to initiate the movement that's how it works because if, if there is no extension nigra both pathways will be working and there is no kind of balance happening then the movement will be uh, well less initiated, and now you understand the, the way it works. Let me give you a quick review of what I have done, so you will understand it in a good way. Now, this is the normal way: we go from the premotor to the potamine through the direct pathway. It will inhibit the globus pallidus internus, removing its inhibition to the thalamus, giving the way to the movement to happen. And through indirect pathway, it will inhibit the globus pallidus externus and will release the inhibition from the subthalamic nuclei. And subthalamic nuclei can affect the globus pallidus internus, which uh, will be stimulated, and then it will inhibit the thalamus and removing the movement. This pathway is to initiate the movement. This pathway is to uh, extinguish the movement or to stop the movement. And the stabus tension nigra is the one which is controlling and balancing both of them. So it will give uh, the place by producing dopamine. I mean, if it's producing dopamine, so the dopamine will uh, will uh, inhibit the in indirect pathway and it will stimulate the direct pathway. And that way it will uh, facilitate the movement. It will, it will uh, facilitate the way to initiate the movement. And by that way, so if you lose the extension anger, you will have a problem with initiating the movement, as I have explained.